Hi, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue reporting from Medscape. I'm here at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions. It's a very exciting meeting, but one of the interesting topics that we're going to be talking about is lipoprotein little a. Definitely one of the hottest sessions of the meeting. So joining me to discuss this topic is Dr. Steve Nichols, who is arguably one of the leading experts in the world on, on lipids. He's a professor of medicine at Monash University in Australia. Welcome. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for being here. So, you know, two phase two studies that we'll circle back to that are being presented um, here at the American Heart Association meeting. Um, and these are for these novel therapeutics that lower LP little a. So perhaps taking a step back, we know that there's a large body of evidence to support the concept that LP little a plays a causal role in heart disease and atherogenesis. Um, but to date, we haven't had any effective therapies to really lower it. Thinking about the therapeutics specifically that are on the horizon, perhaps we could start there. Um, which one is furthest along in, in development, and you know how does that look in terms of its ability to lower LP little a? So most of the therapies are injectable. Most of them are nucleic acid-based therapies, and the one that's most advanced is an agent called pelicarsin. Pelicarsin is an antisense oligonucleotide, an ASO. Um, and it has gone all the way through its early phase two studies. It has a fully enrolled cardiovascular outcome trial. We're all eagerly awaiting the results of that study sometime in the next year or so. Um, and that will be the first large scale clinical trial that will give us some clinical validation to ask the question, will substantive lowering of LPA lower cardiovascular risk? And with an agent that in early studies looks like it lowers LPA about 80%. Which is tremendous because, again, we, we really don't have any effective therapies right now. And I guess one of the big questions is how much do we need to lower LP little a for that to translate into meaningful clinical benefit? What, what, what's your sense there? Well, we, we simply don't know. We try to look to genetics to try and give us some sort of sense in terms of what that looks like. LPA is a little tricky because the assays and the numbers that get spit out can be tricky in terms of trying to compare apples and apples. And, in, in different studies, but you know, we think that it's probably at least a 50, 75 milligram per deciliter lowering of LPA using the old units. Mm -hmm. um, we think that pelicarsin would, would hit that, and so our hope is that that would translate to a 15, 20% reduction in MACE. But again, we've never asked this question before. Uh, we have data from PCSK9 trials showing that lesser reductions in LPA, 25-30% with both evolocumab and alirocumab, uh, both contributed to the clinical benefit that we saw in those studies. So th those agents were really good at lowering LDL, but LP little a lowering seemed to matter. So one would be very hopeful that if a 25-30% lowering of LPA is useful, then an 80% plus lowering of LP little a should be really useful. So in addition to the ASO pelicarsin that you mentioned, there's several therapeutics in the pipeline, but three siRNAs that are at least in phase two and phase three testing at this point in time. So there's Olpasserin, which in phase two testing led to more than a 95% reduction in, in LP little a. And then Lepodiserin, which has now moved into phase three testing, albeit we haven't seen yet the, the phase two results. Um, what is your sense of, of lepodiserin and its efficacy? What's been really quite striking about the siRNAs is, is the even more profound degree of lowering of LPA that we're seeing. We're seeing 90 plus percent lowering of LPA in all of those programs. Um, we're seeing some differences between the programs in terms of um, the durability of that effect. I think it would be fair to say that zelacerin we're starting to see perhaps um, that lowering effect start to taper off a little bit more quickly than the other two. Um, I think that may have some implications in terms of what dosing regimens may look like in the future. But even so, we're talking about therapies that may be three, six monthly, or even with the potential for be even less frequent than that with lepidiserin. But again, I think the phase two data will be really important in terms of giving us more information. Yeah, for the lepodiserin results, you know, I was really quite struck that even though it was small numbers, single dose administered, but it really looked like the duration of effect persisted for really um, at the higher doses up to about a year. It, it looks pretty promising. We've launched the Acclaim study, the large cardiovascular outcome trial of lepidiserin um, with a six monthly regimen, but, but hopeful that more information may be able to 
give us the opportunity for even less frequent administration. And that has really important implications um, for patients where adherence is a particular issue. They may just simply want to come into the clinic, you know, once or twice a year, um, very much like we're seeing with inclusorin, and, 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 and that may be a really effective approach for many patients. And you alluded to the Zerlasrin results, which were what was presented here at the American Heart Association meeting, um, and that even though it led to a robust reduction in LP little a, it looked like the durability component was maybe a little bit shorter than for some of the other therapies, the other siRNAs that are um, currently being evaluated. Um, what's your sense of that? Yeah, it, it probably does, but it, it, the implications clinically, at least in, the, in an outcome trial, when they ultimately get to that point, probably aren't that important. They'll probably just have slightly more frequent administration, and so uh, that probably becomes a bigger issue when that gets out into the clinic and, and, and you know the nice thing is that if all of these agents appear to be effective, are well tolerated, they get out into the clinic, then then clinicians and patients are going to have a lot of choice. Right. And I think more competition is always good news for the field ultimately. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think to your point, you know, when it, especially for a, a drug that might be self-administered, you know, ultimately whether it's once a month, once every three months, it, it doesn't probably make a heck of a lot of difference. But um, you know, I think different choices for, for different patients. And perhaps that's a perfect segue to talk about the oral um, LP little a inhibitor that is also being developed, and, and you presented these results for Muvalaplin. Yeah, and oh, I, I guess, and, and if terms of, in terms of frequency of administration, we're talking about a daily oral, oral therapeutic. So for patients who um, don't want an injectable, are happy to take a tablet every day, Muvalaplin has the potential to be a really good option for them. So we, um, Muvalaplin is a oral small molecule inhibitor. It essentially prevents ApoA from binding to ApoB. Uh, we presented phase one data at the ESC meeting last year showing probably LPA lowering in the order of about 65%. Here we're going to show that that's a little bit more. It looks like it's probably at least 70% lowering using a kind of a standard LPA assay, using an assay that look specifically at intact LPA particles, it's probably well in excess of 80%. And so those are really good results. Uh, the safety and tolerability with Muvalaplin looks really good. Again, uh, we'll need to see that agent move forward into a large outcome trial, and we've yet to hear about that, at least now. Yeah, it's an interesting challenge that you faced in terms of the assay because, as you say, it, it really disrupts the ApoA from binding to the ApoB particle and hence a traditional assay that just measures apo little a regardless of whether or not it's bound to, a, to an apo b particle you know may be sort of a conservative estimate let's say well and it may in particular because we know that apo a ultimately then binds to the drug mm -hmm. so that assay is measuring what we think is non-functional apo a in addition to functional apo a so it's measuring functional apo a that's still on an actual lpa particle but if it's bound to muvalaplin um, we, we think to some degree that's probably an unfair kind of to, to count that and, and that's why trying to develop other assays to try and understand the, the full effect of the drug is really important in terms of trying to understand how do we develop that and move that forward. Is there any evidence yet that the apo little a particle that is not bound to apo b is in fact non-functional as you described it? We think that's likely to be the case um, but I, I think there continues to be research in that space to try and settle that question once and for all. Well, again, I think it's a really exciting time in this field. Right now we have three ongoing phase three trials. We have the Pellicarson trial that is still in follow-up. Fingers crossed, maybe report out next year. Olpasserin, that's also in phase three testing. Completed enrollment and also in the follow-up period. And then we also um, have the Lepidicerin, the acclaimed trial, as you mentioned, um, for people who are perhaps watching and looking to enroll their patients this trial is still ongoing um, right now in terms of enrollment. It is, and, and what's nice about the ACLAIM study is that it includes both primary and secondary prevention patients. So for the first time in a big outcome trial, patients with high LPA levels but who have yet to have a clinical event can actually get into a clinical trial. And, and I'm sure like you, my clinic's full of patients with high LPA little a who are really desperate to get into these trials. And a lot of those primary prevention patients just simply haven't qualified. So th that's really good news. And then. The step beyond that, if we're talking about even less frequent administration, is gene editing. Mm -hmm. And you know that we're seeing those studies with CRISPR uh, um, move forward to try and evaluate, will a single gene editing approach of LPA be all that you need, which, which is even a 
more amazing kind of concept, but that, that's a, a study that needs a lot more work. Yeah, a, an exciting space though, for sure. Yeah. So maybe just as a final thought, you know, you mentioned the patients in your clinic who you have identified as having high LPLA. What are you doing right now in your, your practice for managing those patients? Because I think there are a lot of physicians, practitioners out there who struggle with, well, should I really measure yeah. their LP little A right now? Do I want to know that information? Yeah, it's really hard. And the answer is yes, we do want to know it. We know it's a great risk enhancer. Um, we know that a patient with a high LP little A is somebody who I want to more intensively treat their other risk factors. So I'm aiming for a lower LDL. I'm being much more tighter with blood pressure control. I think there's some argument from observational data, at least looking, that um, aspirin remains a consideration. You know, particularly in patients where you think there's a particularly high risk associated with that high LP little A. And so I think there are things we absolutely can do today, uh, but we can't do anything if you don't know the numbers. So it starts with testing, um, and then we can move on to what we can do today, and then hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll have specific therapies that really enable for us to really address LP little A quite definitively. Well, thanks again for taking the time. This was a very helpful discussion. Signing off from Medscape, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue.